This is a CTV News special presentation. Sandy Ronaldo for Canada. AM. I'm Sandy Ronaldo. Canada AM. Sandy Ronaldo. CTV I'm News. Sandy Ronaldo. I'm Sandy, Sandy Ronaldo. Ronaldo. I'm Sandy Ronaldo. Sandy Ronaldo. CTV I'm News. I'm Sandy Ronaldo. And that is our newscast. Thank you for sharing your time with us. I'm Sandy Ronaldo. For all of us here at CTV National News, good night. Until next time. Four, three and wide. Two, one. And we're clear. Tonight. People don't know who I am, other than I say I'm Sandy Ronaldo. There's a lot more to all of us when you start to dig deeper. 50 years with CTV. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Thousands of stories. And even British journalists accompanying the princess say, Egypt, it is worse. So you're finally here. Yeah. Now, the one story she hasn't told. I didn't expect to find this. Her own. Today was absolutely mind-blowing. How would I possibly begin the search? Somebody. You may find something. Hold on, that's the one. I wasn't sure what the pot of gold was going to be at the end of the rainbow when I began this journey. CTV News presents. I'm Sandy Ronaldo. I remember the first day I walked along Charles Street. I had graduated the week before from university. I cold called CTV and happened to get the head of personnel on the phone. Oh, wow, it looks completely different. He said to me, so can you type? And I said, sure. He said, can you answer the phones? Sure. He said, can you get down to 42 Charles Street in an hour and have an interview with the head of news, Don Cameron? He needs someone right away, stat to start Monday. And I said, I'll be down there in a flash. Don Cameron was sitting in his office. He says, so you want to be in TV? Why should I hire you? And then with the brashness of youth, I said, well, because one day I'll be hosting Canada AM. At which point he laughed, I laughed. Uh, you know, it's amazing what you say when you're young and you have no experience in the real world and you think I can get away with saying anything. He said, okay, can you start on Monday? So I started in his office answering the phones, uh, May 6, 1973. Quebec Premier René Lévesque spoke of a quiet independence. Margaret Trudeau, the wife of Canada's Prime Minister, spent one week away from home. Do you believe she wants to be left alone? I don't, no. Why? And then in 77, they held auditions. From that came a job as a reporter at large for Canada AM. And that was my first on-camera role at CTV. That's a scenario which is being played out far too often. Sandy Ronaldo, CTV News, Lake St. Clair. The Flight Attendants Association has been trying for over a year now. Good morning, everyone. The European Security Conference. My parents ingrained in me the knowledge that if you work hard, you'll achieve. I am a child of Holocaust survivors. They never expected to make it to a country like Canada. And then when I got a job at CTV and they were able to watch me on television, they were so proud. Apart from my family, friends, the fact that I'm a child of Holocaust survivors, I kept private for so many years. I don't really talk about myself a lot. So this for me is uh, an experience as much as it may be a revelation to others as well. I guess it's time to start saying something. I want my children to know and my grandchildren to know. We are who we are because these two amazing people survived 
and walked away from the ashes of evil, walked away from horror, and did what they had to do so that I could have a life. I love them tremendously. They're everything to me. Yeah. It's very important for me to follow in their footsteps, to go back to Poland, to see where they grew up, and to see where they lost the members of their family. As I look around, there's a coldness, I feel, uh, through my body. Auschwitz-Birkenau was a work camp as well as a death camp. People were brought here, Jews were brought here from all over Poland. The women and children being separated, the elderly on one side, the men on the other. And those who were frail, very shortly afterwards were taken to the crematorium and the smoke coming up from the chimneys wafted over the place. We are in Warsaw. We have come back to the city where my mother was born and where she grew up. I'm an only child. Uh, my mother and father, Morris and Mary Bricks. My mother's parents were Avram and Esther Herman, 10 brothers and sisters, and my mom's family. Only three survived, my mother, her brother, and sister. We are going to meet up with Eric Bednarski. Eric. Hi. Eric, who is a filmmaker and has studied the Warsaw Ghetto extensively. In November of 1940, this part of Warsaw and, and a lot of other parts of Warsaw were closed off, so Jewish residents were forced into this area. And there was a, a huge displacement of, of people. Uh, Non-Jews were moved out. Jewish residents of Warsaw were moved in. The building my mom lived in looked something like this. When the war broke out, my uncle he enlisted my mother. He managed to get forged papers for her to say she wasn't Jewish. And she lived with a Catholic family and studied to be a novice and went to church. And when the Warsaw Ghetto was established, my mother was being used as a courier by my uncle to ferry food and all sorts of other supplies to the residents of the ghetto. And she managed to find a little opening in the barbed wire fence and snuck the food in. Ah, there it is. My mother, her brothers and sisters were behind this wall. And, you know, I look at it and I think, why would you wall in a group of people? Why would you do that? Uh, why would you starve them and deprive them of food and medicine? And 
just because they're Jewish. This afternoon, we're going to meet up with Dr. Zachary Mazur, who is a historian, and he also may have some information on my family. Sandy Ronaldo. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have learned about my dad's family. My father's parents were Froyam and Miriam Bricks. He had four brothers, Leon, Avram, Jacob, and Victor. There were no immediate members of his family who survived. I found out that Bricks is not a very common name. Really? Which is actually quite helpful because I think that most of the family was focused around uh, this one town of Shudwovietz. Your family was uh, concentrated into a ghetto in Shudwovietz, and then they were moved as forced laborers to this munitions factory. The munitions factory was quite close by, um, and it was a site of essentially a prison camp. I know my father snuck in and out because uh, he joined the partisans at one point. Oh, yeah. And he also told me quite vividly how they were rounded up and put on the train mm -hmm. going to Treblinka. Yeah. In his region, it would have happened in 1942. And that was the, really the beginning of mass killing uh, through gas chambers and through the death camps like Treblinka. And that's when these transports were happening on a mass level. He and three of his friends jumped off the train as it was headed towards Treblinka. And he said goodbye to his parents and brothers and their wives and kids and jumped off the train while the, there were Nazi bullets being fired in his direction. Two of them survived, two of them did not. Wow. And my dad believed, even when he passed away, that he was the, the lone survivor of his family. Unfortunately, that's most likely. I'm Sandy. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm fascinated. Victoria is a guide. She came in specifically to take me through the Jewish cemetery in Shedlovitz. The family has roots that go deep in this town. Each of the graves and the symbols have own meaning, and I can show you one of these examples. I can say that because there are candles, so she must be a woman. And I can say more that it's your family. This? This yeah. is from my family? Elisa, yeah, bricks. Really? Yeah, this is your family. Wow. I didn't expect to find this. Coming up next. The painful reminder of what was stolen from me. And this is where I met the man who would change my life. This is your family. Wow. She died in 1929. You can read the father's name and her name. Uh, so it was the ratio and the surname, it was Briggs. Rachel. Hi, Rachel. This young woman, my relative Rachel, died at a young age and is buried here. My father knew very little uh, about his family. I'd love to sit down with him if I had the opportunity to and is share this with him um, and tell him, Dad, we've found someone. You know, we've found someone that's a, a blood relative. So it's our custom to put a stone on the gravestone as a way to connect the fact that we're alive today and I'm carrying on for Rachel. So there's
there's the train tracks and there's the field and it was right around here that my father made the decision, the life-changing decision, to jump off that train and run with bullets being fired at him and the train going off in the distance carrying his family away and he and his one friend who survived ran off to hide in the forest. It's a decision that changed his life and I'm here today because of it. How extraordinarily brave my father was, he had to survive. That to me is astounding. Next on this journey is a train ride to Treblinka, which is where my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and cousins perished when they were rounded up from the Warsaw Ghetto, when they were rounded up from the ghetto in Shedlovitz, and were forced onto trains, onto cattle cars, and lost their lives at the, the killing factory. Hi again, Zach. Hi. As we look around here now, uh, there are 17,000 stones. Many of them represent the communities that were destroyed because of this camp. Lives the taken, lives, lives lost. Yes, families. thousands of lives, yes. Nearly a million. Nearly a million. In a short period of time. Yes. This was, unlike Auschwitz, was not a place where people left and people weren't able to bear witness to this place in the way that they were able to bear witness to Because Auschwitz. as soon as they came here, this was the extermination camp. This was the final solution. Exactly. More than 40 members of my family that were somewhere here on these grounds. I would have had such a large, loving family. I would have been embraced by grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins. Walking the grounds of Treblinka is a painful reminder of what was stolen from me. We are at Pier 21 in Halifax. When my parents came over from Europe, this was the first city in Canada that they saw. It meant a new beginning. It meant a chance to start over. It meant a chance to leave everything they had experienced behind them in a place they felt safe. Well, today I'm here to meet with someone who's been retracing my parents' journey historian Steve Schwinghammer. 
probably about eight days sort of across the Atlantic, Atlantic proper, maybe a few days here between the European ports. What we find is that their arrival was in Quebec. Was in Quebec, not Halifax. Still ahead tonight. One of my daughters saw a photograph of a young girl holding a card with her name on it, Helena Bricks. And. I went for my annual mammogram and they found a lump. Stay with us. They were definitely confused because my mom was a nurse and she put down weaver, textile worker. My father was the tailor, my mother was the nurse. It's interesting. Here's the ship arriving at Quebec on the right dates. So I was right about June of 1949. Oh, absolutely. But yeah. the other information is a revelation to me today. There are often these kinds of surprises when we're looking at uh, the immigration history. It speaks volumes to me about what they weren't able to share. Right? Unfortunately, yeah. I've always thought my parents came to Canada through Pier 21. It was stunning to me that they came in through Quebec. And once they got here, they were very quickly ushered on to a train, which has a lot of symbolism for me. Today was absolutely mind blowing. So York University has a very soft spot in my heart because this is where I met the man who would change my life. I met my husband in first year and we were married when I was in second year university. Michael was very funny. There's nothing more enticing than being with someone who makes you laugh. At the same time I knew he cared tremendously about what I wanted to do. And as I began working my way up through CTV, he was my cheerleader. And I could not have accomplished as much as I did without having his support. In 1983, we already had our daughter. Uh, I was pregnant and it was a very public pregnancy. I was on Canada AM at the time. And I remember the last day uh, I was on the air and they brought flowers out onto the set and wished me well. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you all so much. I'm going to miss you terribly, everyone on the program. So I, I took a week off to prepare myself for the baby's birth. And he didn't make it. Something was not right. He, his lungs just did not form properly. We called him Noah, and um, he's still very much a presence in our lives. You know, my, my girls know they had a brother. But again, this was very public. Sandy's husband, Michael, died this morning. Michael passed away in 2005. So it's been a long time since he's been gone. Sometimes it feels like yesterday. Two years after we lost Michael to cancer, I went for my annual mammogram and they found a lump. I've been very private about my breast cancer until now. Between losing my son, losing my mother, Losing Michael, breast cancer. Losing my father. Everyone has something. Everyone experiences loss and tragedy. And I guess they shape us into who we are. People don't know who I am, other than I say I'm Sandy Ronaldo. But obviously there's a lot more to all of us when you start to dig deeper. We 
are here at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. This is my cousin Edie, who has for the past 13 years worked here as a volunteer. Her father and my mother were brother and sister. There was another aunt who also survived the war. Yep. So we knew that one side of the family, there were three survivors. My father for years tried to find other members of his family and he didn't. And when he passed away, he still believed there was nobody. And then about 10 years ago, one of my daughters saw a photograph of a young girl holding a card with her name on it, Helena Bricks. And because Edie was here working at the museum, I said, how would I possibly begin the search for this young girl just to see whether she's in fact related to us. We had launched a program called Remember Me. They took 1,100 photos of children right after the Holocaust by various relief organizations. They were orphans, right? They were orphans, and we put them online. And I followed through based on that website and made a connection with Helena Bricks's family. Helena was living in Israel. Her name was now Hannah Porat. She'd married. Hannah's husband was very, very ill, so I was told it wouldn't be a good time to talk and that she would reach out. And they never did. So I don't know where we stand, but that's kind of where the story ended at this point. Up next, we're going to Israel to find out if, in fact, yeah. we're related. Coming to Israel is a chance for me to connect with my past, to see who I can learn more about, because the family tree only goes back so far. I only know so much. Today I met Bert, <laughs> who is a Holocaust survivor. She's 91 years old. She's a volunteer here at Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Memorial Museum. When the war started, I was nine. I was sent to stay with a Christian family. That lady where I have been living, mm -hmm. she managed one day to save me from the Gestapo. She didn't let the German get into the house. And thanks to her, I'm alive. And you're here talking I'm to alive. me today, isn't that and something? And I owe her all my life. Yeah. And she is here to that day. Your story is so similar to my mother's because my mother was hidden also as a Christian and she went to church and that's how she also survived the war, just yeah. like you. Yeah. 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 My mother found a brother and a sister after the war. My father thought he lost everyone, believed he lost everyone. So I'm here to see if maybe... Maybe you, there's somebody. you may find something. I do hope you can. Welcome to Yad Vashem. Um, I'm Shoshana, I'm going to be your guide. 
This room is a visual of an ongoing mission, okay? The goal of the mission is to collect every single name of every single Jewish person who was murdered in the Holocaust. The book itself is like a blank wall. And that's, that's really what, what six million looks like, a blank wall. But then you open it up and you start to see... Oh, it's really pages then. Pages. So as we open up the pages, you can see names of individuals. And every single one of these people was, was murdered in the Holocaust. It has their name, it has their birth date, and it has their place of death. Can we go to the H's? H's. And H will be on the other side. Okay. Linda? H E R H E R. So many names. Yes. Here we, Here we go. go. Okay. Okay, then so it's alphabetical by the first name. Where do we start? So what what first names are we looking for? So we're looking for Abraham. Okay, so a little bit further. We would look for Abraham Treblinka Warsaw. I wonder if this is my grandfather. Wow. Abraham Herman, Warsaw, Poland, murdered mm -hmm. in Treblinka death camp. I think it is. Wow. He has a name. Mm. It's very moving. Yeah. I wonder if my grandmother's here. What's her name? What was her name? Ethel. Ethel, okay. Or Esther, she went by both. I wonder if she died in the Warsaw Ghetto. Because here's an Esther Herman. Mm -hmm. Murdered there in the Warsaw go. Ghetto. That could be her. I wonder if my grandfather mm. survived to be taken on the train to mm. Treblinka where he was murdered. And this is my grandmother. That's the one, right? That's, That's the one you the saw one. before. Yeah. That's my, my grandmother. Hmm. I didn't know that. I didn't know that she died in the Warsaw Ghetto. Let's see if we can find some of my father's family that would be under bricks. So back that way? B-R-Y-K-S. Oh, okay. Here, Here we, we go. go. Bricks. Okay. Where so were they? They were in Shidlovietz. Okay, so just go Communa. And my grandmother's name was Miriam, and my grandfather's name was Froyam. So, okay, their names aren't here. I'm going to have to add their names. Yes. You don't see it either, right? I'm no, I don't it. see it. Well, hold on. That's, that's my father's brother. Oh, wow. There we go. Hmm. Yeah. Rounded up in Shedlovitz and it. murdered in Treblinka death camp. That's yeah. my father's brother. Wow. I wasn't sure what the pot of gold was going to be at the end of the rainbow when I began this journey. But I'm doing this for my parents, how I have a fuller understanding of what they experienced. But even more so, I now have a greater understanding of how they survived. At Yad Vashem, I also met up with Serafima Velkovich. She studies genealogy. She also took a closer look at Helena Bricks. There's a familiar You see something structure. familiar? Yeah. 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 So uh, do you know the parents' names of your father? Yes. Uh, Froyam, Bricks, and Miriam. OK. Because his father was Baruch. OK. I was a little discouraged when going through the documentation. So I suppose he wasn't a brother, but this is what uh, Hannah submitted. Helena's recollection was that her grandfather's name was Baruch, and in my family, his name was Froyam.
I find myself being very reflective. I'm shortly going to be meeting Helena Bricks's son and grandchildren. I still want to believe that there is every possibility that I'm going to meet members of my father's immediate family. So I'm excited. I can't wait to meet them. Welcome, yes. I'm Sandy. I'm nice I'm to very see happy you. to meet you. I'd like to introduce. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's waiting. In the middle. Nice nice to, meet to meet you. you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. And at the time, I your grandmother, your grandfather. Care, but I think they should go to you. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. The flowers for the moment. All of us. <laughs> OK, thank you. I'm looking forward to finding out all about you. All about everybody. We want to have a conversation. It is wonderful to finally meet all of you, um, to attach a face to Oded because we spoke 10 years ago, right? But your grandfather was ill, and so we kind of left it at that. And subsequently, I heard that your grandmother also passed away. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry to hear that. Eric, you're Hana Halina's yeah. son. And is there another child as well? Or? Yes the father of Oded, we are two brothers. Okay, this was the photograph that I saw of your mother. Was she orphaned at this time? Yeah, I should is say- your grandmother. This is my grandmother, and she and I were close. You know, and the coincidence, by the way, that you're a journalist, and I'm a journalist as well, right? We seem to have a lot, a lot of, of we similarities put, between the families. As we put the pieces together, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Right. And this photo, the photographer kept telling her, smile and she wouldn't and eventually he said he did and she mimicked him and that's how she ended up with this photo so when i found this picture of your mother for me it was all about is it possible that we're related is it possible i have family that i didn't know existed so let me go through the names five brothers all together abram victor Jacob. Labush, Leon, and my dad. We've got that one connection. You're, okay. If we go back another generation, it's Miriam, which I understand is also the name of? Miriam Mania, yeah. Your grandmother. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that age had two names, Jewish and official. Right. So I know she was called both Miriam and Mania. Okay. Well, that would make sense because my grandmother was Miriam and Manya also. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Okay, but Manya's husband was Froyam. This is where we have a discrepancy. Mm -hmm. As far as we know, it was called Bau. Okay. But I still would like to point out that back then everybody had more than one name. Yes, they did. I mean, is it possible Baruch is Froyam? I mean, do you have the date of birth of... You do. Okay, so Froyam was born December 29th, 1880, yeah. in Shedlovitz. Yeah. When was Baruch born? It was 1880 in Shedlovitz. Oh, okay. Yeah. Same year, same town. And it's a small town. Small town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could this be? I tend to believe yes. So many things, so many other things click. The five brothers with the right names, what are the chances that all the five would be exact spot on? Okay, so it's possible, right? It's absolutely a possibility. And you believe that, that your mother's father is my father's, was my father's brother? Yes, it's not oh, like, it's yes. Uh, the five brothers are the same name, the mother the same name, small same town. Same, yeah. This is all very... Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's quite a, it's, it would be quite a coincidence yeah. if it's not, re, not related. Yeah. My father being the youngest one mm -hmm. in the family, considerably younger than the others, 
that he was there the day everyone was rounded up and put on the train, and they were heading towards Treblinka. And at one point he said, I can't, I'm going to try to get off this train. And he kissed his parents goodbye. My dad and three of his friends jumped off, and two of them were shot. And my father and a close friend hid in the woods until the train went off in the distance. And he said, that's the last time I saw my parents. We have a similar story in our family. Tell me. So when my grandmother started looking for her father, she knew the mother was dead. She, she ran into, she managed to find her mother's sister, so her aunt, not from the big side, the other side. And somehow she understood from them that they saw her father after the start of the war. Apparently he was put on a train to Treblinka, but managed to jump off. And that's what we believed for many, many years. And that's why she thought he was alive, because he did jump off the train to Treblinka. Maybe it wasn't him you're saying? Maybe yeah. it was... Would it have been my father's story, or is it the yeah, coincidence? Well, is... The coincidence is, is uncanny. Yeah, uncanny. No, I, I, I agree. Right. Your father jumped off the train. My yes. father jumped off the that's train, right. and... That story did happen yes. to a big brother, and you just not before. the white one, just not the one we thought he was. That's right, my father, it was my father. Yes. Yeah, yeah. it's it just yeah. dawning on me that my grandmother's story actually was true to the, to the, to the last detail, just yeah. not for the Briggs brother she, was, she thought it That's happened. That's right, it was her uncle, Morris, Moshe. I can't imagine having, uh, meeting a, a real Briggs side relative. Yeah. 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 After 50 years of thinking, they're all gone. You know the saying, if you find one person, you open up a whole world. So yeah. we've just opened up a big world, haven't we? You know, we haven't hugged since we found out. I, yes. I feel we should have a group hug. You know, um, we found each other. Huh? Yes. Where's the How amazing is this? Yeah. Yeah. We are so happy. Yeah. I know, me family. too. Me yeah. too. Yeah, we share the same blood. How special and extraordinary is that? But now we'll go forward. <laughs> and we start first by eating, which is <laughs> what we do well. Question for you, and did we make us well? I was pregnant with him, and we knew we think these are all like I just can't believe all that time has passed. Like 50 years is half a century. Uh, there were so few women, I could count the number of women who were on air on one hand. Television has changed dramatically. A monitor? About, like...
I want to thank you all uh, for showing your support and your love, and I'm never going to forget this day. Um, it means a lot to me. It really does. Thank you.